Today I announced the restructure of the Queensland Police Service as part of an ongoing review which started with the Government's initiative for a review of all public sector agencies in Queensland. The restructure will result in more police on the street, enhanced supervision and experience at the operational levels, a more agile and flexible organisation based on mobility and enhanced decision making, and enhanced community satisfaction. The drivers for these changes and restructure including, includes an increasing complex and evolving environment in which we operate, a need to manage the increasing demands for service, the need to focus on our front line, place and case management is a very important philosophy for our organisation into the future, reduced layers of management and technological innovation. The proposed uh, key changes will see our regions reduce from 8 to 5, our districts from 31 back to 15. There will be four new commands, one new division and a fourth deputy's position to drive strategy, innovation and change. There will be an impact on our organisation internally with up to 212 sworn uh, non-sworn staff and up to 110 commissioned officers being offered redundancies. Some redeployment of staff from current to future roles and our new structure uh, is timed to be in place by 1 July this year. I need to thank and acknowledge all of the staff of our organisation for their contribution but we will lose some good people as a result of these changes. Certainly our sworn and unsworn staff are unparalleled in the skill sets and their commitment to the people of Queensland. I want to thank the unions, all of the unions involved in this restructure process. I appreciate their position and their support. And I should point out that the consultation process with the unions in particular is still ongoing. And I want to thank the community. Uh, we all need to keep pace uh, with the changes that are occurring in our own environments. Uh, and I thank them, the community, for understanding that there will be uh, a need for significant uh, issues, retraining and refocusing of our staff during this period. And for those of you in the community who are hiring, uh, we have very, very uh, skilled uh, individuals who will be leaving the organisation and certainly I would, I would suggest that they would make wonderful employees. Uh, finally, uh, I undertake for an, our organisation to not lose sight of our core business during this period of unprecedented change. We will be a better and stronger organisation for undertaking the changes and certainly our focus to stop crime, to make the community safer and to build relationships every day uh, will be centrepiece uh, throughout this period and into the future. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Commissioner, do you have a breakdown on um, how many redundancies will be offered in certain regions? I do, um, and I can um, certainly, depending on the discussions with the uh, unions and final decisions on those, I'm happy to share those ultimately. But as I said, across the service at the moment, there are 200 and up to 212 non-sworn and ultimately about 110 commissioned officers who will be offered redundancies. So you can't, can't say right now at that breakdown? Um, we know where those uh, will occur, but I don't have that detail with me. And um, certainly, ultimately, though, I am happy to share that with you. How big a role have the budgetary concerns played in the restructure? Um, our focus is about ensuring that every dollar of the community's money, every dollar of the government's money is spent in the most appropriate way. Uh, value for money has been key, uh, a key factor in this restructure, there's no doubt about that. Will police have to reapply for their funds off? One of the areas that we're looking at in the restructure is, uh, to be fair and equitable, we may have to spill uh, positions and ask people to reapply for their job, yes, but that is not certain yet and it will depend on a whole range of other factors. Are you looking at asset sales? The, uh, certainly there are a number of uh, parallel reviews occurring and I think that you're all aware of those um, reviews of fleet, uh, reviews of uh, certainly our air wing for instance uh, and reviews of other um, administrative areas of the organisation. 
Uh, whether that ultimately means asset sales, I can't, uh, I can't comment at this stage. Uh, certainly, uh, it's early days yet, and I and I'm, I'm waiting with interest uh, for an indication of that. Uh, early days suggest that um, we probably won't get the 110 uh, or up to 110 at this stage. But until we actually put out the official uh, expression of interest, which will occur reasonably soon, uh, we won't know the answer to that question. Uh, legislatively, for sworn officers, that's correct. Are you considering that? Um, I don't know yet. I'll have to wait until I see what the uptake is in the uh, in the voluntary arrangement. Where, can you just tell, uh, take us through where the regional offices will now be? Uh, certainly, um, the five uh, Brisbane, Brisbane North and South will become Greater Brisbane. Um, so there will be only one regional office here in Brisbane. Uh, the South Coast will retain their regional office. Uh, Toowoomba will retain a regional office. Uh, in the Rockhampton area, uh, for Central Queensland, we'll retain a, uh, a regional office and Townsville. They're the five. Wasn't it Fitzgerald that recommended the eight regions and decentralised the Queensland Is this going to be you know, No, thank you for that question. Um, the restructure is actually going to is actually going to um, strengthen, I believe, uh, Fitzgerald's intent. Uh, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, we are keeping a regional structure and we are keeping a district structure. Uh, Fitzgerald created uh, eight regions based on the fact that uh, that would help prevent corruption rearing its head again within the organisation. In in effect, he created eight separate police agencies uh, within the state. What Fitzgerald didn't have and, and could never have imagined is the impact of technology on performance management and oversight. Um, CCTV was virtually um, non-existent 20 years ago uh, in comparison to where we are today. Uh, the internet didn't exist. This, our systems of being able to um, input data, uh, particularly performance data and crime data and have that live time available to our own officers didn't exist. Um, what we're doing is taking the innovations that are, exist now and, in, and what, where we, had, we believe they'll be headed um, and strengthen the Fitzgerald philosophy of still having regions but, but certainly this, making the span of control much more um, appropriate uh, in those regions. So given those changes, so as you say, it's been 20 years, mm. do you think these sort of reviews are needed every five years or so? Um, Cathy, all I can say is that um, we haven't had a major change like this for a very long time. Um, our, our environment changes on a daily basis. Um, I'm, I am confronted with the, with the issue that uh, we've had a very long period of stability and we've uh, certainly had a lot of progress in that time. But I believe, it, I, I believe and uh, certainly um, the theory and the practicality of where we go for the future, of making sure that we can manage the demand that I know is out there, getting police back onto the street, getting decision making back down with those officers where it should be, is is all part of the philosophy of this restructure. Yeah, I'd like to start for you with the police union, which you obviously thanked all of the unions today. Would that relationship test it again, please? Uh, look, I think the unions have a very, very uh, important role to play in making sure the best arrangements for their members and uh, certainly we're trying to work with the unions, uh, certainly consulting with them on all of the changes that we're making. Um, we're sharing information with them and as I said we are now moving uh, from the release of, the, of these facts uh, officially to a period where we will consult more generally with uh, all of the unions uh, right up till the day that we put this new structure in place which will be the 1st of July. Um, and there may be movement based on that consultation. What changes will there be at the end of the meeting? What changes will there be at the end of the meeting? Is there any staff, net staff loss? Um, in terms of net staff loss, um, the specific numbers I haven't got with me, but what you will see is that we will reduce the number of commissioned officers at, at ESC and replace them with um, staff of other rank. On the existing system of state crime operations command, Where's, where's, there's no mention of organised crime in the, in the 
Oh, certainly that will um, be a significant focus of the new uh, crime command um, that will evolve out of this. Um, uh, this is, when I talk about place and case management um, and boundaryless policing, um, this is a philosophy that um, is, is becoming uh, synonymous with uh, contemporary policing. It means uh, having your police in the right place to attack particular uh, types of crime or particular uh, incidents. Now, uh, state crime has uh, grown over a long period of time. What we believe is that um, by reducing the size of that command, putting those detectives back out where they're needed uh, is a much better philosophy for the future. Organised crime stays within that area and in fact it will grow in terms of uh, its uh, central uh, re responsibility for other organised crime groups, like for instance the major crime group on the Gold Coast, it will actually fold in under the uh, management of the State Crime Command. Well, how much do you think is State Crime? Um, uh, about a third, uh, if my memory serves me properly. In terms of, I'm not, I'm, all I'm doing is redeploying the resources from there. We're not sh um, shrinking in terms of the numbers in that command, but putting them out where they should be, uh, out working with the frontline troops. And is that then being put out to CIT and things like that? Absolutely. More detectives out on the street. but we will still have an organised crime group within that. And just as we have today, there will still be people responsible for organised crime and the different other specific crime areas. There's no mention of organised crime in that new structure? Um, certainly um, there is, well, the, if you're talking about this document, yeah. um, absolutely. I mean, that's only an overview document. I mean, there is a lot of detail that will come underneath that. And that information will be released gradually uh, to all of you at, as we do uh, the further consultations and, you and sorry, and simply finalise the numbers. I mean, the, there is a document of about 150 pages that goes with the uh, organisational structure that actually explains uh, where those numbers will be in the future. I, I think people have got to understand there is going to be no reduction in the number of sworn police officers out there. Uh, in fact, uh, we will have more sworn police officers out on the street out on that front line doing the job. We will have a greater level of supervision. So, so we will have the police where the work is uh, rather than potentially uh, bottle up in, in specialised groups. They will be out there working with the troops on the, on the front line. Just to clarify, do you, I mean, something like Castle Pies are extremely under-organised. Absolutely. Do you keep a sort of amount of people in there? Um, uh, again, I don't have the all of the specific data with me, but Hydra is a very, very important task force that we have. And in fact, one of the philosophies into the future will be a greater reliance on task forces. As you've seen over the years, um, certainly Operation Seymour, which was a task force on the Gold Coast last year, Operation Escalate, which is a task force in Cairns right at the moment, op um, and Hydra, which is a, task, a standing task force. These will be um, uh, enhanced over time as we need to to fight specific crime uh, types or specific groups of criminals. Are you offering redundancy to all commissioned officers? Because if not, how are you doing this? No, there will be a, a blanket um, uh, offer made. Um, what will then occur is a process of, of uh, uh, decision making about who actually uh, takes those. And it's a two way deal. It's, it's both the, the person and the agency when who are involved in those decisions. Um, look, that, some of the timing of this depends on um, negotiations with the union, so I'm not going to put a time frame on it, but certainly what I am saying is that by 1 July this year, we want our new structure in place. Is just nitty-gritty type stuff. If, say, Townsville is actually becoming the regional office, have you made plans yet? Would that be at 1 July or say starting in sorry, Monday Bar, which is also the district office, and your police station? There could be some significant staff changes up there, couldn't there? Um, there will be staff changes right across the organisation, there's no doubt about that. I mean, um, uh, Townsville is perhaps the easiest one because it already has a regional office at Munningborough and so that will remain there. But in places like um, the North Coast, for instance, as you're probably well aware, that, that is no longer going to be a regional office. So that entire regional office will, um, will disappear, Is basically. it a building? Um, it's not, we don't own that building, so uh, we'll make decisions based on, um, you know, business. Um, just normal business acumen. What implications could that have on 
local police to stay in a place like the Sunshine Coast? Is that risk that regional office is going closed? What implications does that have? It means that we're going to be able to take some of the staff, the sworn staff from those offices and put them out on the street. So the public will see um, more police on the street. They will have better supervision on the, on the street. How are we cutting hundreds of staff? How is that going to help the knowledge and safety of Mars? Um, as you can see, uh, we're talking about the 212 at the moment. Um, yep. Okay. Okay. You can't. Uh, by just simply re removing 212 from the equation, that wouldn't work. Um, this restructure enables us to take away some of those bureaucratic layers that we've had, um, and certainly um, the, the realignment of services, um, the economies of scale that we, we will get from having um, the less number of regions in particular, um, certainly allows us to uh, reduce the size of the workforce, but at the same time not reduce the service delivery to the public, which is critical. Sorry, this. Um, the Public Sector uh, Renewal Board uh, and the initiative by the uh, by the government started about mid last year. Uh, we undertook, uh, when that became uh, known to us, we undertook to commence a review process within this organisation. So certainly um, uh, the review process got underway uh, during Commissioner Atkinson's time. But um, most of the significant um, changes uh, have been worked through in the last uh, few months. So reducing the 100 and, saying the 110 and the 212, what, uh, how much does that equate to that extra money do you then have to, to spend on? Um, if we, uh, if we were to simply um, make 110 commissioned officers redundant um, and not replace them, um, the cost of that would probably be in the vicinity of, um, I think it's off the top of my head, about $18 million. Uh, that's not our intention and certainly not, we've, uh, not what we've asked the government for. As you uh, probably understand, there'll be no net loss in numbers within the organisation on the sworn side. So for every uh, commissioned officer who takes a redundancy, we will replace that position with a person at a different level, at a different rank in the non-commissioned area. So that's constable to senior sergeant. Um, uh, by doing that, we're, there will be a saving and it'll probably be in the vicinity of, say, $5 million uh, a year. Um, but I'm also hopeful the government may um, uh, allow me to uh, utilise that money, uh, certainly to reinvest it in policing activities. I'm sorry? Did, did you say 80 or 18? No, 18. 18, 18 million. Yeah. And after you've replaced the NSC officers or junior officers, that $5 million extra you'll have each year. That's right. Yes, that's what exactly that right. Are there any concerns with um, Look, I acknowledge that uh, for every senior officer who walks out the door, um, there are years and years of, of experience and, um, and commitment to this organisation. I certainly acknowledge that. Our difficulty is that that, that experience is currently in the wrong place. Um, and what we need to do is to get that experience back out onto the street. Now, we have many junior officers of, of senior constables, sergeant and senior sergeant who have just as much experience uh, in that operational management area. And certainly it's about growing those skill, that skills base and that experience base that um, where it's needed on the front line. Um, that's, the, that's the challenge that we've been faced with and this is the way that we're dealing with that by, by actually replacing them. Um, there are some places where we'll be doing that. Um, a good example of that is uh, Torres Strait. We'll be putting a, uh, an inspector into the Torres Strait. That is part of our restructure. But, but more generally, we, we do have uh, the difficulty that we've got. Um, we will have a large number of people uh, at, at a particular level, commissioned officer level, that we actually uh, will be surplus. So we'll need to look at replacing them with those lower ranks. Um, that's an ongoing discussion. Is it a robust discussion? Um, there are always robust discussions when it comes to dollars. <laughs> have, have any officers put their, commissioned officers put their hands up to take a redundancy? And if they have not, 
Oh, uh, it's too early. Um, no, there certainly hasn't been an offer made yet. Um, I know that um, the Commission Officers Union um, have, uh, uh, and I'm very grateful to them, they've been out and asked um, their members uh, their views. Uh, I'm not privy to the, um, to the response from that other than that I believe that there have been a number who've expressed interest at this stage, but, um, but certainly uh, it won't be until a formal offer is made and the actual, um, uh, the actual package is known that um, I would expect that anyone would um, you know, seriously be putting up their hand. No, no. I, I said before we do know, we do know in general terms where people uh, uh, who will be offered uh, redundancies are from uh, in this in the non-sworn uh, areas, um, but I don't have that detail with me. But it will become it will become um, obvious and and available uh, over you know over the next couple of weeks. Oh, look, there are implications right across this organisation. Um, this, is mass this is a massive change in terms of um, district offices. Um, for instance, um, you know, you have a district office at Cairns um, and how that, that's affected uh, on the basis that the regional office will disappear and what we do with the number of commissioned offices in that area. And this is where we have the difficulty where people uh, perhaps uh, will not want to move uh, their residents um, and um, how we equitably manage um, a situation where we might have five positions, for instance, for commissioned officers, and we currently have eight commissioned officers, um, even after a redundancy is offered. So we, we need to manage that in a, in a sensitive way, in a fair way. I know you're saying that these commissioned officers, um, for those people that aren't familiar with commissioned officers, they're chief superintendent, chief maintainer. An inspector. Um, most of them have senior management roles. Um, uh, certainly, um, um, for instance, in, um, in, the, in the regions, superintendents would in the main be what we call district officers. Um, some of their positions uh, will in the future, because we're amalgamating some districts, their positions will actually become, uh, as a district officer, will become a, um, become a chief superintendent because of the, the size and the complexity of the district. So we're actually not getting rid of ranks. Uh, I think that needs to be said right up front. There is no rank that's disappearing, but the roles of, of individuals uh, will change dramatically under the new structure. Um, so superintendents are uh, very senior managers. Um, most chief superintendents are what we call an operations manager. They normally don't have a lot of line control, um, but they're there to support the operations of a particular area, whether it's a command, like State Crime Operations Command, or whether it's a, a, a current region, for instance, southern region or, or the southeastern region. There were figures thrown about last week that so many of your chief superintendents and so many of your superintendents would have been gone. Can you confirm that figure for us? Um, I'm not going to confirm specific figures because the smaller the, the, smaller the numbers get, um, the more volatility there will be with those figures, but certainly there are a number of, uh, of positions which will become surplus to our requirements in, in both those ranks. And what would you say? No, um, what I'd simply say is this, we, uh, until such time as we understand what the uh, expression of interest for, for voluntary redundancy is, um, I won't have any idea of what it means in terms of spill. We may have, we may have uh, a redundancy package which is oversubscribed. Um, I just don't know um, how that will, will uh, pan out yet. So I may, have, um, I may end up with vacancies at my chief level or I may end up with vacancies even at superintendent level. However. Um, you know, however, you know, possible that is, um, or I'm, I'm not sure it's likely, but it is possible that that would be oversubscribed. Then we have to look at how we, we backfill in that way. Um, this is about people making choices about their future. Um, the same sorts of choices that, um, you know, people from all walks of life have to make every day. And um, certainly, um, I am grateful and I acknowledge the contribution of every one of the people who will ultimately uh, leave our organisation and we will try and absolutely minimise um, the, uh, the loss of people who wish to stay and have full employment with us. 
Um, that's our philosophy. We will try and minimise that as, as wherever we can. But at the end of the day, this is about uh, more police on the street, decision making where it needs to happen, um, and ex experience and supervision where it needs to happen. So uh, this reshaping of the organisation will not come without some pain, and there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Is it managed uh, absolutely, I do. I mean, Birdsville at the moment is managed from Townsville. So um, when you start looking at those figures and those, those distances, um, I think you'll realise that um, whilst we've reshaped things, um, this is not uncommon uh, for our people to deal with the significant distances that exist in Queensland. Um, thank you for that interesting question, and I'll have to get back to you on that. Uh, now, this young lady over here. Um, we're certainly providing uh, levels of support. Um, I think you know that the, um, the state government, um, through their processes, have actually put in place a series of support mechanisms to help people make decisions about their future. But not only that, I mean, if people don't want to take redundancies there are, and their job becomes surplus to requirements, there is a period of time where they can go into a redeployment pool, they can be picked up by other agencies. Ultimately, though, when they leave the organisation, um, we will do whatever we can to support them in, in helping them try and find other employ uh, other opportunities. Uh, the redundancies given, were they just similar to say the health department that they were actually giving extra money to volunteers or redundancy? Were they really just the same? Um, the, there is a standard um, redundancy package that the state government provide and we will be providing that standard package. Will there be any police stations that are further on to deal with the restructure? Um, particularly ones that you've maybe got higher up like Look, into the future, our, our mode and our style and our models of operation will probably need different styles of police buildings than perhaps what we have now. Um, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. Everyone uh, raises the issue of, of, of their local police station, but in fact, that's not where we want the police to be. We want the police out on the front line. We want the police out with the public. We want the police out doing their job. And that's what um, the future of mobility is all about. Uh, it's about mobile off the mobile office for police, about allowing them to get access to all the information they need out on the road. Um, we will certainly, over time, be looking at the siting and the types of, of buildings that we have, but um, that is a that they are discussions which will go on for many years, as they have for many years in the past. The other the other thing is, and I think most of you in the room know this, that many of our police stations exist in 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 areas where historically uh, they were needed, they were very busy areas, and now um, the need has really moved on um, and there is a different view about where those police stations perhaps should be. But that's a discussion for the future. Just back to an earlier question, I don't think I explained it well. The Mazistar police station, that is also a district office and a regional office, and down there obviously you had see the regional office of hands as well. Um, will there be enough room in that building I'm sorry, uh, I understand your question now, absolutely. Um, uh, and it will absolutely be, uh, um, have enough space because we're also, uh, the style and mode of operation of a region, uh, or of a regional office in particular, and also our district offices will change dramatically under the new model. They will be downsized and there will be a lot of the work that was done at those regions will be brought back centrally under a corporatised model. Um, and there's simple reasons for that. Uh, one is that we can do it because we have the electronic systems that allow the exchange of information and documentation very easily. Uh, and the second one is the economies of scale that give us, we can do just as, just as good, if not an enhanced job, uh, using a corporatised model. Oh, look, that, um, it's an associated question. 
Um, but um, uh, most of you would know, I think we've got 23 current comm centres around the state. Um, there, are, uh, there are other models where uh, we could provide that same level of service to our people and the same safety of our officers and, uh, and the community <coughs> by having a far reduced number of, of comm centres. However, um, that's not been part of this particular um, arrangement because that's a, there's a, that's a much longer discussion because of the technology that, it, that would need to be in place before we could move on that. Um, state crime has uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 600 to 700 officers and we'll be reducing that back to around that four to 500 officers. So as I said, it's about a third, um, a third off the top. But having said that, um, th again, it's not about reducing the ability of us to do the job. It's, it's, it's talking about a different model and philosophy on how we operate. So we see those detectives working much more readily in task force operations uh, where, where um, and if you go back to Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald actually recommended a task force model uh, should fundamentally underpin everything police agencies do and this is one of the reasons uh, uh, that I, I absolutely concur with that philosophy and I want to move the organisation more into that type of philosophy. So it means when there's a problem or when there's an issue or an incident, we develop a task force to either proactively attack it or reactively um, address what's occurred. Something like fighting, for example, uh, uh, I'm going from there, they're going to pop up every now and again. And so That's exactly that right. And, and we have a standing task force called Task Force Hydra, which does that. Um, I don't have those figures in front of me. In the shuffling around as well positions, will people be fighting up or down the pay scale? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Oh, No, um, any movement in any movement in in levels within the organisation is done on a merit-based system. So people would have to apply for jobs uh, if they were moving up uh, up a rank level, and that won't change um, under the restructure process. I um, bearing in mind that um, um, most of our uh, fifteen thousand odd staff. Um, uh, are certainly focused on delivering services to the Queensland community, I would hope that they will all get behind this um, because at the end of the day, this is about doing our job better. Um, look, um, so far it has been positive. Um, I mean, as I said at the start, the unions have a very, very important role to play in ensuring that their members get the best deal from any restructure or any changes in the organisation and I understand that. Um, but certainly from individuals, I think there is a real, um, a real feeling of, of almost excitement out there that we are going to see a new way of doing business, that uh, finally a lot of that layer of management that perhaps has been in inhibiting decision making where it should occur uh, is going to be removed. So I, um, I would hope that um, the majority of our people will see the benefits for them and for the organisation and for the community. Look, um, obviously, um, in, there was, there's always a cost. I don't have a, a figure in front of me at this stage. Um, the redundancies, as I said, um, they will certainly cost us money. There's no doubt about that. But um, this is about investing in the future of the organisation. Um, and there will be other, obviously, associated costs with retraining, um, uh, reskilling in some cases. But these are, these are costs which um, the organisation bears normally anyway in, in training our people, that, that training will just be redirected to making sure that all, the, all officers and all staff members who are going to be redeployed into other roles have the right skills base and the right knowledge and the right tools to do their job. Um, in, uh, the, the boundary of the Gold Coast or what we call southeastern region uh, remains unchanged. Uh, there are differences though, it has been uh, the region in terms of the districts, uh, we have changed the 
uh, the structure of the districts within the uh, within the region. Uh, there will be some slight ones, but the staffing levels, the net staffing, uh, won't change. Sorry, the staff that people see on the road will change. There'll be an increase on staffing on the road. Um, in terms of net staffing, um, there may be some differences in in numbers associated with the region, but the num because we are corporatising some of those positions, meaning those positions will stay in the Gold Coast or, or Logan or, or Coomera and they will be managed out of Brisbane. Um, so there is, um, there may be some uh, apparent changes in numbers, but the staffing on the ground will actually be enhanced. The service that the community sees will be enhanced. They'll see more police on the road. No, both. Um, for instance, uh, with the creation of the Road Policing Command for the state, those bodies, the traffic police who are currently attached to particular districts and regions, they will be uh, on paper transferred to uh, the new command, but they'll operate where they are today. Are you concerned that the Woomba headquarters will remain the Southern Indian That's right. Yeah. And just as a civilian aside, I mean, that, um, you mentioned before that you know, there's this push towards having police be like their own mobile office, so when they're out on the road, they'll be able to access all the information. Mm. Um, picking up a phone and talking to someone, uh, talking to the police is easier now than it's ever been. Um, the, the, the models of, uh, and communication channels are so vastly different now. I mean, um, uh, we expect people to use um, uh, SMSs to contact us and we, we make allowance for that and that will be uh, enhanced in the future. I mean, we have people contact us by Twitter, by Facebook, uh, using social media. So that happens uh, every day. Um, certainly picking up the phone, they'll always get to speak to a police officer. I actually don't need the police officer to be in the station though, and the police officer can be out on the road and talk on a mobile phone. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, in fact, in the future, and please don't get me wrong about this, um, uh, mobility, having, having access to information doesn't necessarily mean a police car with a great big computer in it. It might be as simple as giving them a, a, um, uh, a smartphone with all of that information and all of the apps on it that they need to access our system securely. It might be in a, um, an iPad or a, or a Samsung Galaxy. Um, uh, it might be a police push bike with uh, you know, someone carrying that smartphone. Um, that's the type of mobility I'm talking about, access to our information when and where they need it. Um, it and that's right across the board in everything we do. Folks, uh, unless there's anything else, thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.